I'm ready to today's session. That's uh, part of our series about uh, sustainability and uh, how it's uh, related to business. Today we're going to have uh, a session about the uh, psychological barriers to behavioral change, given by Dr. Robert Tobias. He studied engineering at ETH Zurich, and after that he moved into the area of sociology and psychology. He got a postdoc at the Arizona State University for human evolution and social change, and he is now a senior research assistant at the University of Zurich in the areas of social psychology, where his research focuses on the modeling of psychological processes. I personally met him at the University of Zurich, where he gave a brilliant class about environmental psychology, and I'm very happy that you could take the time to join us today. So we're going to have, as usual, a 30-minute talk, followed by a 15-minute Q&A. Dr. Tobias, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for the introduction. In fact, I also had a small introduction slide, but I will skip that. And I will just start with the topic of changing individual behavior. Now, um, uh, you still didn't share the screen. Oh, is it not shared? Sorry. Then I need to check this. So now is it? Nope. Perfect. So sorry for that. Um, so changing individual behavior, what is it good for? Um, you might say, okay, mainly for the huge problems you face, you need structural change, you need institutional changes. However, many of them require also changes of individual behaviors. You have the effect to actually affect as we wish they do, or also to make them possible in the first place. Now, the big question if we try to tackle problems for individual change is what behavior change actually has the positive effects or mitigates uh, behavior. And here the point is that when we go down to the individual level, things are getting much more complicated than on the aggregated level. The impact of an individual uh, ch uh, in changing his or her behavior depends much more on the specific situation. So in what form the current behavior is performed and what would change by switching to what form of the target behavior. As we are here about a sustainable uh, brown bag on sustainability, have a look on the particularly difficult case of um, the environmental impact of individual behavior changes. The situation is much more complex than mostly communicated in like the public discourse, just as an example of mobility. I mean, everybody knows that car driving has a massive environmental impact. You should drive less car. But what would happen if just person leaves his or her car at home and switches to the bicycle? If you look now on the individual level, just observe this person doing it, you will see that, first of all, the car still is there. So all the impact of producing the car, of providing infrastructure, still remains. On the other hand, the person will uh, use the bicycle, will require more calories due to the additional uh, effort he makes or she makes, and producing food is also at a very high uh, environmental impact. And now it depends much on the situation, what car is used, how, uh, what does this person eat to determine whether we have actually an impact or not maybe even a negative impact. So it's quite easy if the person uses a relatively energy efficient car and is not eating very sustainably that the impact is even negative from this switch. Uh, there are many other examples like for example the meat consumption it is not a very good idea to replace like this waste meat uh, like in sausages with meat replacement because this meat is not even used it's waste or just given again back to the animals while the replacement is has to be produced and it also has quite high environmental impact 
So it's much better to replace like high quality need and not the low quality need. Take energy, photovoltaics. This has a very high climate impact, particularly because of the production, coal based production in China. And you might now wonder is there any individual behavior that actually has a huge impact or where we can be sure that there is a huge impact? And in fact, there is, but it's almost not discussed. This is having less children. So having children is maybe the one behavior that a person can. Um, reduce most the environmental impact he or she has. So why do I tell it? Um, if you think about behavior change, just to start with it, uh, you have to carefully evaluate what impact you will actually have. In the environmental area, it's particularly complicated, but in any behavior change campaign, it's important to well specify what you want to change. But assuming you found now this behavior change you want to do, and you're pretty sure that it will have a positive impact, at least for a specific group, then we can do a behavior change campaign. Now, what's that? Uh, I would define it like a large scale, low impact, low cost measures based on psychological and other techniques where the effect of such a campaign comes from the mass. So we have a very little impact on the people. They change only a little, but due to the massive change of a lot, uh, large number of people, still a campaign can be very effective. There are like um, misconceptions that psychological measures have no effect or they are harmless, and these are quite wrong and problematic. In fact, um, for most psychological problems, we have well-established effective measures, so we can uh, change quite robustly most behaviors. And in fact, it's much, you know, much better how to change behaviors than what behavior to change. And mostly people think it's the other way around. And very important, campaigns are not harmless. So our measures, psychological measures, can have a quite negative effect. And so we really have to design campaigns carefully and ideally, we also have some um, institution that controls what we are doing. And then the final point of the introduction, unfortunately, I cannot present you campaigning uh, in its entire uh, beautifulness, because for this, I would require an entire day or more. Um, campaigning not is, is not only about the techniques, we first have to specify the problem, we have to find what psychological barriers we have to overcome, then we have to be determine the behavior change techniques, we have to determine diffusion techniques to uh, distribute the behavior change techniques in the population, then we have to put it all together to a campaign, which is much more than its elements, and we require knowledge and experience in the methods of data gathering to have the tools to adjust, to design, to control campaigns. Here now in this half an hour, I only can uh, present you an approach, specify barriers to the change and give you a very short glimpse on classes of techniques that we can use to overcome these barriers. Okay. Now, in order to change uh, behaviors on a scientific basis, it is necessary to determine what human behavior depends on. And in this regard, many fundamentally different viewpoints can be found. So some people argue that human behavior is largely random or determined by free will, and so it's totally impossible to explain or predict human behavior. Others say it's uh, like, determined by just one factor, for example, just by money. So they just think about money and that determines the behavior. So first of all, we have to define what's the point of view about human nature to understand how we approach um, the problem of behavior change. And now for here, for this session or my approach, 
uh, starts from the following point. First, human behavior is explainable and predictable. And the reason behind this assumption is that humans mainly live in groups. So it's important that we know more or less what the others will do and also can be conscious about what they will do in the future. But um, human behavior depends on a large number of factors. It's not only one and it's factors they act in combination to determine the behavior and then maybe the most important point the assumption that the way people behave is like optimal in their perspective and in the situation where they behave and now optimal does not mean um, optimal regarding some external criteria say optimal regarding costs or optimal regarding environment and it's sometimes not even optimal according to what the people would say if they reflect about the behavior. It's rather the behavior that best fits in that specific situation, or we can say there are always good reasons for doing what people are doing. So it's never just laziness or stupidity or something like that. There are good reasons. And therefore, our task as uh, campaign planners is to make the target behavior, the optimal behavior, for the target population in the situations where they perform the behavior. And this again requires that we take the perspective of the people of the target population. So we have to see like from their eyes why they are performing the behavior and then build on this to design our campaigns. Now, what I will present here is based on a large number of uh, psychological theories and models for explaining behavior. However, this is not a scientific theory. It's rather like an application-oriented tool that helps managing the psychological complexity. Uh, the basic idea is to define a space of psychological factors that allow specifying the problem this means the barriers we have to overcome, the psychological barriers, and the solution, which would be the effects of our techniques. So therefore, you will not find like the classical psychological constructs such like attitudes in the scheme. Uh, it will be rather dimension of comparable aspects of behaviors that themselves distinguish from other dimensions which stand in conflict or at least um, affect the other dimensions. So for example, if I have to decide whether I eat a cake or fruit, then I have a conflict on one hand, I know it's better to eat the fruit. On the other hand, I like more the cake. So this would be conflicting dimensions I would like to separate. But for example, whether it's expensive and Good for the environment, this would be not conflicting. This I can compare and I can say, for example, how much I would pay uh, if the uh, environmental impact is lower. And on this basis, then we can start with the, uh, this scheme. And as I said, this is a space of dimensions, but the first thing already are, is a, a categorical separation. We have preconditions to perform a behavior and we have the evaluation of the behavior. And the reason for this separation is that people usually not evaluate the behavior where the preconditions are not met. For the preconditions, I assume two dimensions, the feasibility and the awareness. Awareness means that people have to know the behavior, how to do it, does it exist? They should not forget it in a decisive moment and it must be considered as a viable option in a certain situations. For example, somebody might go shopping and simply think that it's not possible. It's not a, a in the space of possibilities to use the bicycle to go shopping. You have to do it with a car. So it's not considered as something that can be done. Visibility is simple, just whether people think it's possible to do it or not. So these are like the two dimensions of the preconditions. And then the evaluation has four dimensions, which I separate in two that are rather done with the head, it's rather reflected, and two that are rather automatic or done with the guts. So if you reflect about a behavior, then first of all, we have the instrumental evaluation, 
which is what maybe most people are uh, comfortable with. They know this is a form of cost benefit calculation. So everything that we can express when we think about that it's better or worse would go into this instrumental evaluation. But there's another way of evaluating the behavior by thinking about it, and these are norms and goals. On the one hand, a behavior in itself can have a value, a normative value. Um, for example, we rather do something that more people are doing, which is normal. We rather do things that other people uh, see as the right way of to behave, particularly if they are observed. On the other hand, um, norms and goals also can interact with other dimensions, particularly the instrumental evaluation, by defining what, in what direction we prefer certain characteristics to be. So imagine you know a restaurant is very expensive. Is this now good? Would you choose this or not? This depends, of course, on norms and goals. If you invite your boss, you might go rather to the expensive one. And if you try to and live on a low budget, then you will go to the cheap ones. It's not totally defined just by the instrumental characteristics. And then there's an important concept, the symbolic value of a behavior, because people not only do what a behavior appears uh, as a main function, say, so the instrumental value of a behavior, as an example, mobility, instrumental a uh, function of mobility is to come, go from one place to another. So we take the car to get from uh, the home to the office, for example. Now the symbolic value is what do I express with this? So if I take the car, I also express, for example, that I'm rich, I'm powerful, or when I have a small car, maybe electric car, that I am interested in the environment. So the behavior expresses something. And if we try to change the behavior and so what the person expresses with it would change, then we will experience resistance. So people will not want to perform a behavior that shows them in a way they don't want to appear in front of others. This is the symbolic values. Then on the automatic side, and we decide with the gut, we have first of all the affective evaluation. This is rather easy. It's how much do we like or enjoy a behavior or how much we don't like it. Um, and again, we have here a special concept. This is all the affective values. And the point here is that we continuously need to keep our emotions like in a positive range. So we're always under certain pressure that we are annoyed, that we feel bad, that we are stressed. And we need to relax, we need to get back into some uh, positive emotions. And this we do also by performing certain behaviors. And again, if we now ask people to change the behavior that has an important effective function, then we have to provide them something else to control the emotions, or we have, we'll have a strong resistance. People will not change something they need for example, to relax. And then the final dimension is the needs and tensions. It's a bit more complicated thing. It's experience, very much like emotions, but an effective evaluation is emotions rather determine what we rather do or not, if we have, we have to select, while these tension states actually can push us towards certain behaviors. This can be physical states like hunger or pain, there are certain cognitive tension states, for example, if you feel disgust or injustice or something like that, then you feel like a pressure to do something. It can also generate such tension states, the commitment. If you commit to a behavior, then we want to perform it. We feel bad if we, have, we do not perform this behavior. If we feel good, if we could perform it, even though it was difficult. But this is like an artificially created um, tension state. And these Values I mentioned, any um, threat to values, particularly to the symbolic or affective values, will be experienced as a tension state. So we will react very strongly if our values are uh, threatened. And this is felt as a tension state, which can block any behavior change or even lead to changes in unwanted directions.
So, and then we can put this together in one scheme where we have the six dimensions and we can now draw in this like uh, what is the problem, what is the barrier we have to overcome, or also what are effects of behavior change techniques, which technically would be done like in a radar, uh, radar diagram. So we would have in the middle nothing, and then the more it goes away from the midpoint, the stronger would be effect. So here it would be mainly, for example, a barrier regarding instrumental evaluation, but it also has some um, effective aspects. Now, from a number of reasons, it's a bit more complicated or more difficult also to read, to use this technically correct uh, form. And so I usually just draw on the edges or over the diagonal what are like the critical dimensions. So what you just have seen would be, again, instrumental evaluation is the main problem, for example, the main effect of a technique, but it also goes in the direction of the effective evaluation. And then we have some other systematics. So we have this cognitive effort. And as I said, on the left side, it's very something we have to think about. On the right side, we have rather automatic processes. Uh, on the top, we have inhibitory processes. So they make, they hinder that a behavior is performed, but not necessarily make us to perform a behavior. And on the bottom, we have pushing elements that really can push us towards a certain behavior, not necessarily to the one we want in a campaign, not necessarily towards target behavior, but it has the ability to motivate us to action. Now, uh, unfortunately, it's not enough to know um, what are the psychological determinants. Um, we also have to think about uh, how we can approach change. So what is the point that lets us change these um, psychological determinants? And here again, we have six dimensions in two categories, which is, uh, first of all, changing objective characteristics of behaviors. This is relatively straightforward. So we can, for example, change the rules, such as laws, change the market with economic instruments or change infrastructure services, for example, by providing or removing products. More interesting, of course, at least here for this session, are psychological, so for ecological perspective. Um, so it, how can we change behavior without changing the objective characteristics of um, the uh, target behavior or the current behavior? And here again, we have three dimensions. First, we can change something, um, or we can target the person, which means that we change the, their sensations or experiences, which then should remain uh, unchanged until something else changes. This, for example, other measures, talking to other people or experiences with the behavior. But this is a bit like the normal approach in psychology uh, to change behavior. However, we also can change the situation or how a situation affects the people. And finally, we have the a bit special situation that the problem is not so much the person itself, their opinions or the situation, but the interaction in the population. So imagine a group where everybody wants to change behavior A to behavior B, but all everybody is waiting for somebody else to start the change. Then they are locked in while everybody wants to do B, but nobody does it because the others don't do it. They have a lock in situation and this requires some special techniques to overcome. And again, we can add this to the other scheme and this is then the complete scheme to categorize uh, problems, to categorize solutions to categorize the barriers of change or the effects of behavior change techniques. Usually we will draw something in the part of the determinants, at least one dot will come here and another one in the part of the triangles. I will give you just some examples of how this scheme can be used. 
For example, a very classical argument for not changing behavior is that the target behavior is too expensive. How would we categorize this? There are two ways. First, we can say it's so expensive that I simply cannot do it. Then it would be related to feasibility. Or we can say it's too expensive in the sense of it's not worthwhile. So it's I can do it, but it's simply not worth the money. Then it would be categorized this uh, instrumental evaluation. In both cases, the problem would be a person-related problem. Somebody is always forgetting to perform the behavior. This is a problem of the awareness. So the people do not think about the behavior in a specific situation, and therefore also a situational problem. Or we have um, the problem of a social pressure. So I feel that I cannot do it. Others will laugh at me if I would do this. Or also that I would have to um, behave in a way that I don't want that other people see me like this. And this would be categorized in a way of uh, or, or highlighting the norms and goals. And the tension states is the social pressure. So I, due to the norms, I feel pressured. So I feel like fear of being excluded, for example, which then are the, the tension states and which can be the, the population situation aspect in the first case. So if it's a, like a, a social pressure from others, if it's rather the problem with the symbolic values, it would be rather a person focused problem. Then it might be that a behavior provokes not very nice feelings or is if the, uh, the current behavior is required to feel better, to relax, then this is a problem with effective um, values, so a threat to the effective values. So it is an effective evaluation on, on the tension states. Or a rather population focused problem is that very often in um, environmental settings, why should I do it? There's too few people doing it, so there's no not enough effect. So it's not worthwhile doing it, or that uh, I'm not doing it because I would feel exposed uh, if I would do it alone. So this being alone, this is then the first case, rather an instrumental evaluation. So it's not worthwhile doing it because there's too few people, or a normative problem in the second case. I feel exposed. It's not normal to do it, so I don't want to do it. But in both cases, it would be a population focus problem. So that's about the barriers. Um, now I just would like to give you an idea of what we can do with this. So once we have defined what problem to overcome, what techniques, techniques to exist, or what classes of techniques, it will be very abstract, this final part, uh, can be used to overcome such uh, barriers of change. First, uh, the say simple and often very effective approach is to focus on the situation, not even on the people, which is, might be more psychological, but to focus on the situation. Um, and here we can change the situation itself. For example, the classical example is reminders. So putting a sticker somewhere changes your behavior because it reminds you to do something. There can be other signs, for example, showing what's allowed or forbidden, or the, the now very on board nudging would also fall in this. Or we can prepare people to the situation with the idea that the situational effects are reduced, and so people rather act according uh, to what they intend to act and which hopefully is the target behavior. That's good examples of planning, self-commitment, or now also on board the challenges. And finally, making the behavior public can be used for all uh, classes. It can be used for situation-focused problems, for person-focused problems, for population-focused problems in any way. And here, classical techniques is a public commitment, so people commit, but it's also uh, published or recruiting influences. For person focused techniques, this is mainly the most widely used and maybe also the most prototypical approach um, used for psychological measures for changing behavior. Um, here we can transfer knowledge 
on resource persuasion, particularly informing about behavior, how to perform it, or to change mental models to remedy misconceptions. Uh, then we can use the classic argumentative persuasion to change instrumental evaluation and norms. And finally, there are techniques of affective persuasion that make people like more the target behavior or less the current behavior, or it's also to increase the intrinsic motivation to change. So for example, by putting some gamification in it, so to make it a bit more game-like to change, uh, which also helps um, promote behavior change. Finally, there's a somewhat special class of techniques that provokes tension states, particularly by highlighting discrepancies between values and behaviors. For example, by highlighting that the behavior damages the environment, but the persons value high environmental protection. This then can lead to a change, even though it's not so sustainable, because usually there will be another discrepancy so that the people might change back to something else. Then finally, we have approaches for population focused uh, problems. Um, here we can mainly improve the networks and exchange in a, a population, particularly if the problem is a heterogeneity. So some people know something, others not. Some people have something too much, others lack it. For example, the problem of food waste that people can provide food uh, they do not need to people that need it. Or then classical techniques is distribute, distribute the risk of showing a behavior as an individual within a larger population. This can be, for example, agreements that we all agree of how to manage certain resources, for example, or also conditional participation that we say to the people they only have to participate if enough other people participate, or that they do first a commitment, and then when they have to decide to change their behavior, they know so many thousand other people also committed to change and then they're more safe in their decision to change. Again, the behavior can be made public and also sometimes in literature you find that participation can help in the situation. If the group is very small, it can be a technique, but mostly campaigns deal with so huge populations that participation is simply not possible. So we cannot make 10,000, 100,000 or millions of people act in a participative program. And finally, the problem can be individualized. This is, of course, if it's possible, a very good solution. And then you apply the person focused techniques of the previous slide. So this is very fast what you can do. Of course, I would really like to go deeper in it, but this would take quite some time. So I would come now to an end and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So now we're going to have another 10 minutes of Q&A. And maybe I will start it off by asking you for a concrete practical example of something you've seen, of an example of a bad campaign for changing behavior. Do you have something that uh, comes into your mind? Yeah, unfortunately, there are quite many <laughs> quite bad examples. Um, I don't even know where to start. There are many, many ways of doing bad campaigns. Um, one, so very often, maybe even the most frequent error that is made is really to select the wrong behavior and to target too much on the behavior. So that, for example, many campaigns on food waste that only lead to a change in the behavior. For example, there's a very famous campaign in London they made where people switched from cooking to pre-cooked food. So the amount of plastic waste increased tremendously and the energy waste was enormous, but the food waste was close to zero afterwards. This is a very badly designed campaign. Okay. There are also campaigns that are ethically very problematic. For example, there was a campaign where the idea was that children would put pressure on their parents to make holidays like in a more sustainable way, for example, not to fly away. And here you put people, and in this case, even children, in a very difficult situation with a very uh, strong conflicting social pressure. And this is something you should avoid. This is something you should not do to provoke so negative emotions from which people cannot escape. 
This might be quite effective, but it's something that's ethically very problematic. I think it's also a very bad campaign. Then there are many campaigns that target the wrong people, that target people that are already interested in it. It's more like, um, for example, just telling people this has a high um, uh, carbon dioxide uh, equivalent emission without telling that this is a problem and how to change it is usually not effective because you simply do not, only people that already um, know about it, understand what's the problem and so most probably already changed the behavior will understand what the campaign is about. So you have to think about people where you still need to change. So people that drive the car because they maybe not even know that this is a problem or they don't know what are the alternatives then what do you do for need to do for them? Also often it, many campaigns just are like um, advertising campaigns to show we are a good group. We are somebody who should uh, yeah, get money or power or something like that. And the environmental aspect is just forgotten behind it. And this is also something so, uh, in many cases, in many campaigns, we, in the end, not even made a campaign about the problem, but about something else that led to the behavior change without that the people even knew or wanted to know that they changed also, for example, something for the environment. So for example, if you make a campaign that would show uh, environmental friendly behavior as something that shows a status and people switch the behavior because then they think they might be more uh, attractive for others then we are happy with this even if people say all these green guys are stupid and this is all uh, nonsense with the environmental uh, damages the goal of the behavior change campaign is to change behavior and this might be done even in a way that we as a group stand there as something that people don't like and this is, I mean, a big problem that it's many so-called behavior change campaigns are advertising campaigns and not behavior change campaigns. Okay, thank you. Are there some questions, some other questions? Or comments or feedbacks? Can we just jump in or? Sure. Is that okay? Um, Robert, this is this is a very long, a short question, but a long answer, I'm sure. So, be my guest in terms of how you abbreviate it. But with COP26 going on right now, which obviously gets a lot of attention, uh, but the big focus is on what government's doing, uh, what big business is doing. Meanwhile, something like 65% of all carbon emissions come directly from households and SMEs. So they come from us. Um, and without massive behavioral change at this level, uh, we're not gonna be able to meet these targets, regardless of what the governments or the big companies are planning to do or can do, if you will. But this is such a massive undertaking and, and you're looking at so many different types of behavioral change. Um, what would, <laughs> How would you map this out? Because obviously you can't accomplish all this in a year or two. It's it's a long-term process to change consumer and small business behavior. But where would you, where do you start, in your opinion, mm -hmm. given what you've said? And and can you actually develop a, a roadmap? Can, can 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 the government develop a roadmap in terms of what changes should be happening and when they're going to be happening? Mm -hmm. yeah, that is a very interesting topic. We discussed quite a lot and maybe I have also a bit of a different view here than you. Um, so I think the potential of mere behavior change is relatively small for problems like climate change. I think really climate change is mainly a structural problem. So we cannot just by changing our behaviors, we have a relatively small uh, like potential actually to uh, reduce it exactly because we have quite a number of needs like for example we need to show our status we need to uh, feel better 
And there is, so the, on an instrumental level, there's a lot of things you can do, but you cannot say to people, do something that makes you feel bad. I think this is simply an ethical problem. And particularly in climate change, I think it really, we can do quite a lot of structural change. In the end, the main top problem is that we use the right form of energy. And of course, for this transition phase that we say, try now for five years or 10 years to reduce certain activities until we change to more sustainable forms of energy, this might make sense. But I think on the long term, it's a bit illusionary to think that people could do just half of what they're doing now. So they need to, we need to provide them um, forms of behaviors that are less environmental damaging, that provide the same functionality. So the not only the instrumental, but also the effective and symbolic um, functions that they need. Uh, so I really think it is mainly uh, government, it is mainly in this technical aspect to really solve uh, these like, global problems like climate change. And in the case of climate change, it's even relatively easy. So we see how difficult, really how slowly we advance in something relatively easy. We have so many other environmental problems where uh, things are quite different. But in the end, I think the one behavior that really is required under this scenario is just having less children. I think the population is too huge and we might overcome climate change without any reduction in the population, but there are so many other resources we are just using up that, and people have so much difficulties and in really reducing the impact that I think we simply have to reduce the population. But I'm pretty alone with this point. So I don't want to say that this is like the opinion of the environmental psychologist or something like that, but I really think that um, in the core, so from individual behaviors, the most important thing is having less children later in life. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> Very comp complex subject, as we know. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, maybe one addition. Um, if I say that it is mainly a technical and uh, institutional thing. This does not mean that individual behaviors don't count, because in the end, it's are individuals that have to accept them, it's individuals that have to vote these governments, it's individuals that have to ask for products, that have to use the product so that it's worthwhile producing them. So I think in the end, the key is the combination of structural and psychological measures. And we need also to think when we design new products, for example, we should not first do something that is environmental friendly and then think, oh, how can we sell it? So we really have to design, we have to consider psychological aspects in designing new services, new products, so that then it's easier to make people use them, to buy them, to want them. So also to ask, hey, we need here something new that is something that uh, you can um, develop. So I think individual behavior is important, but the actual effect, environmental effect, will happen from the structural side, supported by the individual behavior, and not by individuals only, um, say, reducing their activity, which would be the only way to do. So if, uh, if we try with individual behaviors to reduce, for example, environmental impact, this means being less physically active, uh, doing less things, do everything, being less mobile, uh, stay at home. And I think there are limits. So we cannot say to the people now for the rest of the life, don't leave your home, try not to move, things like that. So we people require certain activities. And with this, there will be already quite some impact if you do not some structural changes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Maybe one last question because you brought this controversial point about uh, children. Do you think this counts also for a very environmental friendly and environmental conscious couple that they should have less children or maybe none at all? At all? Uh, none at all is not a good idea. 
because then we run into problems of loss of um, diversity in the human genome, and then we will have even more troubles with things like corona or so, other uh, uh, diseases. So the idol would be every person has one child. I think this is really important. No child is not a very good idea. And then the point with the very environmental friendly couple, if we really come to the point that it does not matter, individual behavior does not matter, then we might say, okay, then we can have as many children as we want. But it is important to note that just the existence of a human already has quite an impact. So we need infrastructure that has provided. We have many services that are provided based on the number of uh, the population in the country, say hospitals, for example. So just that there is a person, an additional person, even if this person itself with the behavior has zero impact, already has quite a large impact on the environment. And of course, we can start building infrastructures that have close to zero impact and so on. And if we reach a state that a human has zero impact, then we can have as many children as we want. But in the end, every organism has an impact on the environment and the environment can handle a certain impact. It's also not a problem. And we just have to see that we're below, below these. But in this moment, every additional human is has an impact. All right, thank you. That's certainly something to think about. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you will find the resources on our website in case you want to study and go a bit more in depth in these techniques and the uh, scheme that we learned today. Thank you, Tobias, for your time. And uh, see you, everybody, next week for our next session about data futures. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.